How many of you guys are still um, pretty excited about what the Lord has done over the last two weeks here in our church? Uh, I mean, it's, it's literally miraculous what God has done over the past couple of days. And uh, I'm ready for the Lord to top what he has done over the last two weeks again today. Anybody with me on that? I mean, I, I believe that we go from glory to glory. It keeps getting better. But what I also want to say is that today might be a little bit different than what you think it might be on how that fleshes out. And um, I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, not that the service is based on me, but I'm feeling a little bit off today. Uh, if you didn't notice, um, I, I had crutches and they're gone, which means I'm, uh, maybe I'm healed or it means the buck grabbed them from me. Um, so I know... Most of you guys are wondering what happened. So uh, Erica and I have this rhythm where once our kids turn eight, every two years, we do either a mother-daughter day or a father-son day. Uh, my man, uh, Mr. Ezra Big E, just turned 10 about a week ago, which um, that means that I have more and more gray hairs. Uh, but what we did is we went, uh, we went on a big hike. We went up Old Rag Mountain. It was, it was awesome. We got up at 3.50 in the morning and started hiking uh, when it was dark outside because that's what men do. And uh, got up to the top, uh, and there was on the way down, there was a piece of ice, and I rolled my ankle. And uh, when, when I rolled my ankle, um, there was, uh, we'd seen one other guy uh, bef uh, since that moment. One guy we saw at the top. There was nobody else. We're talking like six hours. And right as I rolled my ankle, this random guy, like, he appeared, it felt like, over at the side. And he, like, he ran over. And he tells me, he's like, he's like, hey, my wife's a homeopathic nurse. I have stuff for you. And he pulls out, like, these little bottles with mystery pills in them. And he's like, hey, put these on your tongue. They're going to bubble for a second, and then you can, you can take them. And I, I just took them. Like, I don't know what they were. I don't know if I'm going to fail a drug test next week. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but if my theology's off, blame it on the hippie who gave me drugs on the mountain. Uh, it was good. I felt fairly okay the rest of the hike. Um, no, but he had, a, he had an ace wrap as well. He uh, wrapped my ankle up, and then we had five miles to go down the mountain after that. And uh, I'm going to call my son out for a second because on the way down, we made it about a mile, and we see this truck for like a park ranger. And I'm like, this is, this is exactly what I need. There is a guy here sent by the Lord to carry me down the mountain. And um, I look around, and I can't find the guy anywhere. His truck's there, and I don't see him. So I'm like, hey, buddy, come on, let's just go. And at the bottom of the mountain, he tells me he knew where the guy was. He was behind the building that he was working on. So... Um, if you see a park ranger and somebody's limping, tell the park ranger that happens. So um, I'm just ragging on you, buddy. I love you. Um, so that's, uh, that's the first thing. Uh, second thing, um, we can't make what happened the last two weeks happen again. Like God can do it because God's fully in control. God can do miracles every single day of the week, but we can't come in with an agenda that we are going to force these things to happen because it's not in our control the moments that God decides to heal or the, God, or the reason that he decides not to heal. So that would be the, the second reason that today might be a little bit different than you're thinking. Um, the third is, is that we're going to talk about eating flesh and drinking blood, which is not a strange subject at all. Um, okay, let's be real. It's a little bit odd, but we'll get to it in the text. What happens after the miracle is the question that I have been pondering throughout this week. And uh, we, we have seen some, some pretty significant things happen this year so far. Uh, our church has grown by 52% since the 1st of January, which is, is that, that, that's unusual growth that takes place. Uh, we have seen documented miracles take place. Um, Brian Monty got up here uh, last week and testified about the fact that he had incurable cancer and that a, another doctor looked at all of the, the records and said they don't see any evidence of cancer anywhere. Remember, he pulled up his phone and he showed that that happened. Um, now, in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, I hope this goes well when he goes to his cancer doctor. And so he, he asked his cancer doctor that he went to, and he just told me this in the lobby a few minutes ago, and he asked the, the cancer doctor, do I have cancer anymore? And the doctor looked down for a second, looked up, and said, we see no evidence of cancer in your body. 
uh, and not to recap everything that's happened, but there was a, a, a baby that had a, a heart that was not formed correctly. It was miraculously, instantaneously healed to where no operations are needed. There was a grandchild in our church who had a blood issue going on. The blood issue has been cured. We are seeing relationships that were destined for failure that are on a path of reconciliation right now. We are seeing miracles take place in our church. We're seeing people get saved. People giving their life to Jesus for the first time and declaring him as Lord and Savior. We're seeing people get filled with the Holy Spirit, and the fruit of that is evidence of God's goodness in their life. Like, do you guys realize we're in an incredible moment as a church right now? Like, like if you could classify it as, like, good vibes, which we know the gospel is a lot more than that, but there's some good vibes in this room right now, and I'm going to praise God for every single one of them. But what happens after that moment? Like, does it mean that when the miracle doesn't happen the next Sunday, that things are going downhill? And I would say absolutely not. I believe that we're still taking ground for the kingdom. And and this is um, one of these moves, you have to understand, that doesn't happen every single day at a church. And, And who knows, God could show up right now, and we could see people get healed, and I could run laps around this auditorium at the end of service, and that is very plausible, and I'm believing that God can do these things. But but what we need to look at is what happens when we pray for things, and the prayer answers don't go the way that we think they should. Because if, if you're like me, there's moments where you pray for something, and the outcome that you want isn't the outcome that God gives. And so how do you reconcile that? And so we're going we're gonna to look at John chapter 6 today. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open there. We're going to go through the whole book of John. Um, it probably is going to take a month or two. I'm going to do it all today, so let's go for it. Um, John chapter 6 is a remarkable passage in Scripture. It starts off with the feeding of the 5,000, if you remember that story, and that references 5,000 men, so if you could do the math, um, many of them were married, many of them had kids, let's just call it 20,000 for the sake of argument, 20,000 people show up and they get fed with what? There we go, five loaves and two fish, we got some people that are ready for Bible trivia right now, like that, that's a miraculous moment, Right? Like, I've never been to a service where a kid shows up with a Lunchable and we all go home with leftovers. Like, like, that's a pretty big moment. And then right after that, Jesus literally walks on water. I mean, from one miracle to another. And everybody's mind is so blown by this that, that they try to find where Jesus walked off to on the water. And there's like a boat race to go find Jesus. And they're trying to figure out where he's at. And then if you go to the end of John chapter 6, you're going to see that the majority of people that were with him at the beginning are now gone. And so that, that makes you ask some questions. Like, where did the momentum go? Is it okay for the momentum to die? Uh, and, and I would say that the... The bigger question is not necessarily where the people went and why the momentum died, but would you still be there at the end of John chapter 6? Because the crowds definitely were not. You see, after the physical miracles took place, the crowds were ever present. But when it was only Jesus, people did not have the spiritual maturity to stick with their faith. And my question is, is Jesus enough for you? Would you still be here if it was just for Jesus? And I'll tell you for me, uh, emphatically, yes. Like Jesus is sufficient. Let me give you four concepts before we dive into the passage this morning. People overall care more about today than they care about eternity. People want the miracle for today. People want the breakthrough for today. People want the good feeling for today. They want the emotional healing for today. They want the psychological healing for today. And I'm all for that. And I would vote yes and amen. And anytime something like that happens, I'm like, come on, God, you did it again. Woo! I, I, I get amped legitimately for that. Because God does care about today. But all of those things are short term moments. Because even when cancer's cured, all of us have an expiration date. Even when you get through the hurdle, there's going to be another mountain for you to go over. And I'm not trying to like rain pessimism on this. It's just the reality that we get so concerned with today that we miss the reality of eternity. 
And I believe what God wants to do, not just what I believe, what I know he wants to do, is to work in our heart when it comes to all of eternity. The second thing I would say is that we tend to be more concerned about our outward life than our inward life. I mean, you all got ready today. You took a shower, you got your clothes on, you brushed your teeth. We're all thankful for that. Like, that's good news. I, you guys look good. It's good news right there. But, but how's your soul? How are you inside? Did you get yourself spiritually prepared for the meat that's going to be shared this morning? Or are we like so many people in our society that just worry about doctoring up the outside appearance and we neglect the inside struggles that may be happening? Number three, uh, people are bandwagon fans. Um, today is the Super Bowl, and uh, I don't think that I had ever met a Kansas City Chiefs fan before this week. Like, I just, I just don't know many, uh, many of them. Like, I've seen Eagles fans that are out there occasionally. Like, there's something a little bit wrong with them, and that's okay. Um, all, but, like, all the Tampa Bay fans from last year or two years ago, they're all gone now. Like, I don't know where they went, but the Tampa Bay fans are all gone. Uh, all the uh, Patriot fans from the last 10 years, they're not wearing their jerseys right now. And it's, we got even boos going on for that. But that same person saying boo may have been saying yes 10 years ago. Maybe not. I don't know. But, but what you see is that people tend to hop on bandwagons. And when the team is doing well, they're for it. When the team is not doing what they think they should do, they're not necessarily for it. It's very similar to how followed, following Jesus goes for the crowd. When the wins are happening, I'm going to say wins, they're all for it. But when there's... The struggle, which for the record, Jesus still overcomes the struggle every single time. But when it doesn't go the way that you think, the bandwagon tends to get less and less and less, and the crowd diminishes. We are bandwagon people. And with those three things, I know I said four, we'll keep it at three. Let's go ahead and dive into the text. John chapter 6, verse 25. Get your Bible hats. I don't know what those are, but get them on. We're going to go through a lot of scripture this morning. Uh, pray with me that this will be taught well. Um, God, we pray that... Your holy scriptures would be taught in such a way that each and every one of us, myself included, will get a better understanding of who you are. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we left off at the, the beginning of John 6. Remember, feeding the 5,000, Jesus walks on water, boat race. That's how I'm going to call that right there. So now we're picking up on the boat race, uh, verse 25. Uh, when they found him, after the boat race, on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And when they say signs, it's not referencing miraculous signs, it's referencing all of the signs that pointed to the fact that he was the Messiah. He's calling them out saying, you weren't actually after me because I'm God. You were after me because I had a Panera Bread shack open and you had all you can eat. He said, you're not after me because you actually want a relationship with me. You're after me simply because of the miracles that were being provided. Do not work for the food that perishes. Jesus is actually calling out his own miracle here. Not degrading it by any means, but what he's saying is this miracle that happened of the feeding of the 5,000 just a couple verses before, that's the work for the food that perishes. But for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, I love they have southern manners. Sir, give us this bread always. So if you notice in this passage, they are, are giving glory to Moses for the manna. 
Uh, in, in, in this passage, we're going to look a little bit about the difference between glory and gratitude. There's a very big difference in it. But, but they're referencing the Old Testament moment when manna, bread, was literally falling from heaven. And then it would disappear and come back the next day over and over again. All you can eat bread was miraculously coming down from heaven. Uh, when you look at the Passover meal, it references several Old Testament moments. One of these is this, that God provided for his people. And that's a good thing. But if you've heard me say this once, you'll hear me say this a thousand more times, that when you see something take place in the physical in the Old Testament, it references what's going to take place spiritually in the New Testament. The battles of the Old Testament are a physical manifestation of the spiritual battles that take place in the New Testament. So when it talks about manna from heaven in the Old Testament, it's referencing the manna, the bread of life, Jesus, who is the bread, who's going to come down to conquer things spiritually. Manna is the physical representation of it. Jesus is is the uh, spiritual representation of this. And when they were trying to give glory to Moses for all of this, Jesus calls them out. And Jesus says, hold, hold on for a second. It wasn't Moses that gave you the bread. It, it was God that gave you the bread. And granted, Moses was a big part of that. And it's okay to show gratitude to Moses, but you don't want to give the glory to Moses because glory belongs to the Lord, right? Uh, it reminds me of, of marriage uh, counseling scenarios. You sit a husband and you sit a wife down and you ask the, the wife, how, is, or how are things going? She goes, man, I got this, this great house. We got food on the table. Uh, my kids are all clothed really well. And, and I just want to give glory to God for all this stuff. And the husband's over here in the corner being like, girl, somebody's got to pay those bills. How come you're not mentioning me? Like, I know God's good, but look, look here. I'm the provider for you right now. And, and it's okay to... Give glory to God, but it's okay to also show that you are thankful to somebody else. It's also okay to be able to um, give gratitude to somebody else for the things they're doing. In the same way, you could flip it and you ask the, the, the guy, and I'm being super stereotypical right now, and if that's not your family system, uh, disregard. But the, the guy could be talking about um, how things are going. He goes, well, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. I go home, and the house is always looking great, and the, the food is always cooked on the table, and you know, my kids are so well-behaved, and I just thank God for kids like this. And mom's going, these are your kids. And they're a lot like you. I had to do a lot of work to make them more like me. And, and, like, and, and giving glory to God is good, but it's okay to give gratitude to somebody else. And we should be people that are willing to give gratitude for this. Where these believers were making mistakes is they were giving glory to Moses and not giving glory to God. And so Jesus corrects them on this and goes, hey, you need to make sure that you are giving the glory to God himself. And then in that conversation, verse 28, they asked this question that tells a lot about their heart. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And there's an idea in faith systems, every single faith system with the exception of Christianity, where it's all about works. It's all about the things you do to be able to get into heaven. So my question for you is, are we saved by works? I would say yes. It was a trick question. Because there was a work that was done that granted us salvation. Now, it wasn't a work that I did. And you're right to say that your works don't save you. But Jesus is the one who did the ultimate work on the cross and his work was sufficient, and it covers my sin and it covers your sin to where we do not earn our salvation. Like if you're on your deathbed and you're going, I wish I could have just done more to get into heaven, you've gotten it totally wrong. You cannot earn your salvation. It is all based on what Christ has done. He completed the finished work on the cross, which is why he ended saying it is what? It is finished. He is the one who's done the ultimate work. We cannot earn our salvation. And people have this fear inside of them of a, man, I, I just got to do this or I'm not going to make it. I'm just so afraid I'm not going to make it. If I would just do this, I'm just, I hope I don't fall short. And they're just filled with fear and their fear drives their works. And, and fear is not enough to be able to get you to have genuine life change. What is, is love. 
Because when you love somebody, you behave so much more different. And so our works don't come out of our uh, attempt to gain salvation. Our works come out of the fact that God has done everything and we love him so much, we can't help but express our love through the works that we show. And so do works matter? Absolutely. Are works a part of salvation? Yes, Jesus is the one who did it. But it needs to be done out of love and not out of fear. You will always do more for love. Your body needs constant maintenance. That's why you should eat a good breakfast. For those of you whose stomachs are rumbling right now, it's probably because you ate too many country-style donuts out in the lobby and don't have good food inside of you right now. Your body needs constant maintenance. But what is more important is how your soul is doing. And as we cut through these miraculous moments that have happened through the last couple of weeks, we need to check on how our souls are actually doing. Because if you're just going to feed yourself in the flesh, you might feed yourself with things that are other than Jesus. And these things other than Jesus are going to let you down. You could try to feed yourself with success. There's always going to be somebody more successful. You could try to feed yourself with relationships But if you've been around the world long enough, you know that divorce is a possibility for roughly 50% of people who get married. And those who do stay committed to each other, your spouse is going to let you down at some time. And so if you are just trying to feed yourself with things other than Jesus, your soul is not going to be satisfied. It will never, ever be satisfied. And so what we're, we're talking about is the reality that Jesus is the one who has saved my soul. That Jesus, if you put your trust in him, is the one who saved your soul. And that brings up the question, like, can you lose your salvation? Which is a very, very highly debated topic in church. And I don't think that's a very, very fair question right there. I think a better question to ask would be, can Jesus lose you? And Jesus can never, ever lose you. Like, you can try to run, but he's fast. I'm just telling you, he's he's, he's going to catch you. Jesus is never, ever going to lose you. He is never, ever going to leave you. He is never, ever going to forsake you. Everyone else in the entire world may abandon you. This church may let you down. I may let you down, but Jesus is the one that never, ever will. He is after your heart. And so Jesus drops this statement halfway through John chapter 6. And this is where, like, everything completely explodes. So up to this point, you got the feeding of 5,000, Jesus walks on water, the boat race, people asking him questions, all these things happening. And then Jesus drops this, I am the bread of life statement. You see, Jesus can do something greater than a physical miracle in your life. He can transform you spiritually. Verse 35 says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the fathers give me, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Talking about the fact that if you come to Jesus, he will never ever cast you out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is sufficient. If if not one more miracle happened in our church, and for the record, I believe that he can and that he will. We have seen it happen here, church. But if it did not happen, if not one more miracle happened, Jesus being the bread of life is sufficient. It is enough. You see, we become so earthly minded that we tend to elevate the physical miracle and we tend to lower the spiritual miracle. We tend to think that the temporary breakthrough is greater than the spiritual breakthrough. Do you see how we have this completely backwards? Like, I I love healing. 
I believe in it. Eric and I have seen two of our daughters get healed. Physical, documented healing. Brian and Bethany Monty, man, they love healing this week. Come on, he's back at work, y'all. They love physical healing. Buck and Vicki Stowe, they love physical healing. Their baby's good. That's a good moment right there. Hanson and Don Butler love physical healing. The blood issue is gone. Do you know what they value more? Spiritual healing, spiritual renewal, salvation coming through Jesus Christ. That is something that you can take with you beyond the grave. And so Jesus drops that statement that he's the bread of life and people get mad. You see, miracles happen, I would say, fairly regularly. We just don't open our eyes to it. Miracles are a regular part of the New Testament church. And miracles happen by the hand of God. But miracles, you know, they also can happen by the hand of the devil. If you look in the Old Testament, you could look at Exodus 7. You would see that there is some moments where there is evil spirits that are doing signs and wonder. If you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it promises that in the end days there's going to be miraculous signs and wonders done by the enemy. If you look in the book of Acts chapter, um, I think it's 7 or 8, somewhere around there, there, there's miracles being done by some witchcraft that's going on. Like, like miracles can be done at the hand of God. There's also some things that cannot be scientifically explained that are done by the hands of the enemy. Um, you can look at, at witchcraft, which is extremely real. We don't see it as often in our country because it's looked down upon. But I, when I was in Haiti and I could hear the witch doctor drums and I heard the stories, I'm telling you, it's very, very real. You can look at the life and the fame that can be found through Hollywood, and it just shows off the power of demonic influence. We literally, in our society, got to watch a satanic show that took place within the last seven days. And it, it just shows off. The power that the devil can have. He does have power. Now, does it trump Jesus? It's absolutely not. But miracles can be done at either hand. And people, you know, rarely are upset by miracles. When miracles happen, it's not all that threatening. When you go, this person was cured of cancer, no one's like, no, nah, I don't like that. I'm going to hard pass on that. Give that back. Like People aren't against miracles. And so when Jesus is performing these miracles, what happens? Little numbers or big crowds? Big crowds take place because people love miracles. People chase these things regardless of the source. And if you're only chasing the miracle and not the God of the miracle, you could be chasing sources that will not save your soul. They get frustrated, not that Jesus does miraculous works, they get frustrated when Jesus gives a, a deeper truth. So John 6, verse 41, so the Jews grumbled about him, just grumbling around. Uh, probably it was a group of men because that's who they would have documented. So I'm picturing like, like this old group of men sitting in the corner of the synagogue, almost like Hardee's, just like grumbling about the government and the weather and all these other things. I promise I'm not pointing at Mike Catron right now. Like it's just this group of people that are just grumbling about stuff. They're just mad at this and mad at that. And they're mad because Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. I can't believe he said that. I'm here for his miracles, but that's, I, mm, I don't know about that. And what gets wild is that Jesus doesn't just say it, but like he doubles down on it. Like you remember in the, in the Christmas story where it's like, I double dog dare you. It's like, oh. What could be greater than a double dog dare? A triple dog dare. A triple, yeah, Jesus is going to do a triple dog refreshment of this in this moment. It's awesome. So after Jesus ticks everybody off by saying he's the bread of life, he says this in verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now I'm just going to, put this in here. If you're new to church and we're talking about eating flesh, this sounds like zombie apocalypse going on right now. Like when you start talking about this topic, like people leave the church, maybe the hipsters that have black t-shirts on and converses whose dads didn't hug them, they may like something like this. But like for the rest of us, we're like, this is getting a little bit weird right now. 
He says, I will give, it. did you just say that I just describe you? <laughs> That's awesome. Your dad loves you. His name's Michael. That's a good name. Uh, and the bread of life. You know, I was thinking about saying that because it's in my notes, and I was like, nobody would be here like this, and sure enough, we got that. Uh, and the bread of life I will give uh, is the word, uh, the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So more grumble, grumble, grumble. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me and also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. And I would agree with them. Like, if the, the rabbi got up and starts talking about all this stuff, like that's, that's hard stuff right there that you got to kind of pick through and figure out exactly what's going on. They said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this. So, so Jesus doesn't just say that he's the bread of life, but he doubles down saying that they need to eat of the flesh and they need to drink of the blood and then he triple dog dares and responds back and goes again and he probably quadruple dog dares and does it another time and he keeps on hitting it over and over again. Like I'm thinking if I was the disciples and he drops it once, it was probably like, ooh, did he mean to say that? Then it's like, oh, he, he meant to say that. Oh, there he goes again. Like he keeps on doing it over and over and over again. And what we got to realize is how do we extract the truths out of this passage? Because we believe the Bible is literal. Like the Bible is the literal word of God. Now there is plain literal and there is figurative literal. Like if I was going to tell you, I'm so hungry, I could eat some tacos. Everybody loves tacos. I'm so hungry, I could eat some tacos right now you would know that I want what? If I said, I'm so hungry, I could eat a horse. That does not mean that I want horse. I still want tacos, just for the record. Like, uh, you see, one of those was plain literal. One of those was figurative literal. I'm not literally looking to eat a horse. But both of those express literal truths. Like in the book of Matthew, when Jesus says, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, Jesus is not saying, I'm a chicken. Like, that's not what that verse means. It does not mean that we have chicken Jesus. What it means is there, there is a, 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 a literal moment of that, but it's figurative literal that Jesus, as a mother him, would tuck her chicks under her wing, that he wants to do the same thing for the children of Israel, which would also be believers that are found in Christ today. So, when Jesus says, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, is that plain literal or is that figurative literal? It's figurative. And there are some denominations that would argue with that. Uh, there's a theological term out there called transubstantiation. And that is when people believe that when you take communion, it literally turns into Jesus' flesh and the wine literally turns into Jesus' blood. There are parts of Catholic churches that believe that, some Orthodox churches that believe that. Uh, that is, seems really off and nowhere in Scripture do I see that implied. And then like what happens when you have the communion bread and you drop the bread, like did you drop Jesus and then you're all guilty? And like there's, there's a lot of problems with that in my opinion. Um, I, this is not a, a plain literal. This is a figurative literal part of Scripture. And so Jesus asks them, have I offended you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said... 
This is why I told you that no one comes to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And after many, uh, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And so Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So let's just recap this moment. This John chapter 6, I am the bread of life. Feeding of the 5,000, massive crowds. Jesus walks on water, massive crowds. The boat race where they're trying to find where Jesus is. And then they begin to ask him questions. And he talks about how he's the bread of life. He talks about how he have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. And then he tells one of his best friends that he's a liar and going to hell. And everybody leaves. Kind of a wild scenario right there. But when I say everybody, I I mean that not literally because not every single person left. It was just the majority of the crowd who left. And that made me ask the question, why did so many people leave? And I, I know that the heart of this passage is that while physical miracles give evidence to the goodness of God, physical miracles are not the end goal. Because your physical miracles will have an expiration date on them. And and I'm here for them. Please understand. I believe in them and I'm here for them. But what I know is that physical miracles point to the spiritual miracle that Jesus saved your soul. And that is good news for those who are in Christ. My hope is that we never stop chasing miracles. And I'm going to go and invite the worship team back up right now. I I don't want to ever stop chasing the miraculous. But what I don't want to happen is that I chase the miraculous over chasing the God of miracles. That I begin to think that the physical miracles here on earth are more important than the spiritual miracle that Jesus saved my soul. Like, he is the God who can. And he is the God who will for every single person who is in Christ. I guarantee you, your miracle is coming. I fully believe it. But then you might say, well, Michael, what happens when it doesn't? And I've had some of these conversations this week. You're like, this is great that these people experienced the miracle. Where the heck is mine? And the reality is is that Jesus always comes through. It just may not be on the timeline that you want. He has promised us everlasting life. He has promised us new bodies. He has promised us no more pain. He's promised us no more tears. All those things are coming. It just may not be in the time frame that you want. And so now we have this tension as believers. And it's a good tension. Tension is a very, very important thing. This tension of, I believe that God can show up and I'm counting on him to show up. But I also know his plan is greater than mine and his timeline might be higher than mine. And so what our response should be is like when when a, a miracle testimony happens up here, and you guys have seen them, you've seen this take place. What's the typical response that we should have when a miracle takes place? Give it to me in three, two, one, go. Caitlin, that was the most excited crowd I have ever heard for cancer disappearing. I mean, I felt it. It didn't feel awkward. No one hesitated. That seemed great. All right, we're going to, you guys are warmed up right now. When cancer is eradicated, in Jesus' name, what is the response that a congregation should have? We got people jumping up on their feet. People jumping on their feet. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. All right, hold that. Hold that. What should the church's response be when we see a spiritual 
miracle take place in somebody's life. Go for it. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm going to get up on my feet right now. I'm excited. See, I don't want us to have such a shallow faith that we require the physical manifestations to give us insight on what the spiritual truths are. I want us to have a church that has a deep enough understanding to where we can say, Jesus saved my soul and that good news is sufficient for me to be able to give my God praise. I believe that he can do it. I believe that he will do it. And just like they said in the book of Daniel, even if he doesn't, he is still my king and he is worthy of my praise and so as we're coming off this right now this is not what happens we don't come here and crash what we do is we hit a new baseline now and we say God our spiritual life is right here and however you want to take us from glory to glory we're gonna trust in you we're gonna lean into you and we're gonna say that you are good every single day come on church can we respond and worship this morning